just a quick you know overview i think there's a common language that the church's family i have been a part of a church where uh the pastor said it pretty often that you know we are family we are family but sadly um from my experience i mean i'm sure there are you know many people that felt that way but for me personally um i don't think it was so much like that i, I think you know there are different standards that people have and um I think based on my experience, it was the case that the pastor and the elders overall thought there was a family-like thing. And I'm not even going into like Acts 2-4 where everyone sells their possessions and say, selling among all. I don't even go there. I don't even, but uh, just when it comes to the overall closeness and, and family uh, family aspect. Uh, and I, I don't think I was just someone that's isol that was isolated and far away. Uh, I think this was overall kind of generally how it was, where like, as I shared, um, most of the times, uh, it's like 1% or 2% in your local church you're pretty close to, but most people, uh, you might pass by and say hi and not much there and stuff, but as we went over last week, what we see in scripture is, it's not like there, there's a Bible passage. It's not like there are Bible passages that say, okay, you should be really close to each other and share life. But remember how we saw, um, was this, uh, I think this may have been a little new, but remember the verses we went to where we saw it in 1 Corinthians 5, where it says, if anyone says they're a Christian, but they're like sexually immoral or they're greedy or they're, um, you know, reviler, etc., it says, Paul's telling them to not even um, eat with such a person, not don't have fellowship with them. And I was making the point, how do you follow that? How do you follow that? Where it says that, well, I mean, there, there are wonderfully, you know, occasions where some people, they confess their sin, but uh, it's not even that. It's like in 1 Corinthians 5, if somebody says they're a Christian, but they're living in sexual immorality or they're greedy, and I especially use the example of being greedy, I think usually people don't know that they're greedy when they're greedy. Because it's not something as you know direct and plain clear like sexual immorality, right? I mean, sexual immorality is straight up like you're having, you're committing sexual immorality with somebody, but something where someone's greedy, it's... Uh, Usually, where I think other people will notice it better than the person themselves. And the Bible saying, if somebody says they're uh, a Christian, but they're, I don't know what transition you have, but it can be greedy or it can be covetous. And if that's the case, then uh, you're supposed to kind of go into maybe like a semi church discipline kind of thing where you withdraw. And so, Okay, what's the manifestation that someone's uh, a greedy? And as I said, no one usually they're they're not like, hey, um, I just wanted to share, guys. I'm greedy. Like I've never experienced that. I don't think that really takes place. It's basically that uh, you you share life with each other, and. Uh, as you're sharing life, you come to know, you know, when you're kind of more close to somebody, you know what's going on in each other's lives. And they might mention things like, um, you know, whether, what kind of stuff they buy, how much they spend their money on this kind of thing. And you know what, I would honestly say, if you notice a professing Christian, a brother or sister in Christ, honestly, from your, you know, conversations and your interaction, they seem to be like using the money in a pretty unbiblical manner. I think this is very relevant, by the way, as those who are living in a wealthy country. Usually when you're closer to somebody, you share, you know, I, I bought this, I bought that. I mean, I will never back down on something like this, but if you have a, a Christian brother or sister, or someone that says they're a Christian, but let's just say every time there's a new iPhone or something or new cell phone, uh, they spend hundreds of dollars 
and they get rid of the old one or something or whether like new laptop or whether you know car related stuff or this or that unnecessary um you know money spending i would say there should be we'll go into this where you you care about them and so you bring it up it's concerning uh there there this is really not a good good stewardship i think we know passages about stewardship right um how we spend our money how we spend our time and things like that and um i mean we're not doing a study on the topic of uh, money and and wealth but you know that there are so many warnings in the bible regarding money like all over the place uh jesus warning about you know um you can't have two masters. Jesus speaking about um, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man, that issue. Jesus calls money an uh, unrighteous mammon in Luke 16. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, that when we have food and clothing with these, we shall be content. And also in 1 Timothy 6, those who are rich in this age, make sure they're sharing with other people towards the uh, middle end of 1 Timothy 6. And then like Hebrews 13, verse 5-ish, where it says, Be free from the love of money um, and be content with such things as you have. So I, I, from the top of my head, so many passages on the issue of money. And so when you, uh, when you love the brethren and you're close to them, you, you're supposed to, if it's the case, that this is the case, then you're supposed to kind of notice it. And hey, you bring it up to the brother. I know I have brothers where I can bring this up like we're close enough and they would totally welcome my rebuke or something I'm concerned about because they know that by God's grace I'm familiar with scripture and um, you know these these kinds of things and uh, as I shared uh, like a week or two ago I brought up something to um, one brother about how he uh, uh, treated his daughter one time I went over to his place and I noticed he um, he spoke to his daughter in a, I mean, it, it was a pretty surprising thing. I didn't expect that, but he spoke to his daughter in a really bad way. And so I, I told him that and he appreciated it. And um, so yeah, First Corinthians 5, this kind of thing where we love each other enough that we're involved like this. You know, again, just read that First Corinthians 5. It says, if anyone says they're a brother, but they're sexually immoral, this or that, don't um, have association with, don't fellowship with them, no. not, not even to eat with such a person. That's what it says. So if somebody has a problem with that passage, deal with God. <laughs> I didn't write it. Um, that's what God tells us. But the basis and reason is not because God just wants some people to be like, you know, isolated and like just, um, what do you call that thing? Like, um, where you're like, you know, bullying them or something? No. It's because uh, it's based on love. You care about that person. You want them to be spiritually well. And we're supposed to want that. Look, if I have something where, you know, I, I'm gossiping and I, know, I don't notice it, um, I'm greedy, or uh, I speak in a way that is wrong or whatever i want um of course I, I want mature brothers or sisters that know biblically well to bring that up to me because that's for my benefit and you know um this is something that i think we'll, we'll start out with uh this issue of correction for one another the thing is you only notice things like this, not when you just meet for 15 minutes once a week and it's kind of superficial and like shallow. No, you only notice these things when you like, there's, there, when there's much more sharing of life with each other. So as I said last week, according to the Bible, it's implied that there's much more closeness, a sharing of life time together you see in the book of acts acts 2 uh, acts 2 3 4 where it tells us that like they met daily that they continued steadfastly in the apostles teaching fellowship breaking of bread and prayers that's 242 and then uh, 
44. Now all who believed were together and had everything in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided among all as anyone had need. And then next, 46. Now continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Look at that. They're meeting in homes. And no, I'm not saying you have to meet in homes, but um, like I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm not against church buildings. This is fine. But just here we have, they're meeting daily in their homes where the atmosphere is just natural and you just, you, you know how it is when you go over to people's house. You just, such a sharing there. You feel much more comfortable and you're really just acting more uh, naturally. So breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, uh, praising God and having favor with all the people. Uh, so they just, there's just so much more involvement in each other's lives. And uh, like when it comes to, um, you know, last week, Hebrews 13, 7, we went there that um, when it comes to the leaders, um, it says like, uh, remember your leaders who have spoken the word of God to you, their faith imitate considering the outcome of their conduct. So I made the point, it says imitate their faith. So what kind of imitating of what? How do you imitate their faith? It's, it's lifestyle. Okay, it is lifestyle. Um, how they lived out their Christian faith as Christians, how they live their life. That's what it's talking about. You know, I went to also, uh, you know, the first Corinthians where Paul says, be imitators of me. It, they're kind of very similar. It, there's overlap, but making the point that it's implied that you see your leaders, how they live their life as Christians. Not a uh, Sunday, the sermon time, and then like, you know, briefly after the service, 10, 15 minutes. What do you see there? Almost nothing. You see what they talk about, how they talk, but that's definitely not, that's like just nothing um, in light of what the author has in mind. So I, I was making this point, but if you, um, just quickly, like if you go to, um, Either First Timothy three or Titus one. Um, First Timothy three. This is uh, page three, and under closeness implied, according to many passages, you'll see Hebrews thirteen. But above that, you'll see like First Timothy three, First Timothy three and Titus one. So how how about First Timothy three, Titus one? In what kind of setting, context, does one know whether they're biblically qualified to be a pastor? So, this is quite amazing. This is quite huge. But, um, think about this. Okay, in 1 Timothy 3, Paul's going into... Somebody want to read 1 Timothy 3, uh, 1 through... Uh, even just 1 through 4 is good enough. Um, Here is a trustworthy saying... If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, a husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. Okay, so I think you might have an idea of why I came here. Yeah, so, okay, the qualification of a pastor slash elder is this right here. Above reproach, husband of one wife, basically faithful in marriage. Um, he, he has no one other than his wife when it comes to women. Temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior or uh, uh, respectable it can be hospitable able to teach that's easy to notice but other things not so much not given to wine not violent but gentle not quarrelsome free from the love of money 
and one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. Okay, when it comes to things like above reproach, when it comes to being a husband of one wife, that's a little easier. But being above reproach, being temperate, being self-controlled, being respectable, being hospitable, and then uh, skip not giving too much wine, that kind of depends, not violent. Basically, uh, the character ones, if you have somebody where you might, okay, let's just say this person is already a pastor in a church. How do you even know whether these are true or not? Whether they have an issue uh, with violence um, or like, uh, whether they're free from the love of money or where they're above reproach if it's the typical setting that we know of and then there are other cases where you know how there are lots of cases where like um, your pastor stepping down and then you're like quote-unquote hiring a new pastor that kind of thing what's typically done is usually you know there's like a what, what do you call that resume and like okay this person went to this Bible college or this seminary. Uh, maybe they have a THD in theology. Uh, that's usually like the number one thing, which is, I mean, to be honest, I think that's, I understand it, but that's in a way pathetic because first to me, three lays out character, 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 character mainly. And anyone, I mean, it's not hard to go to seminary. You don't, you're not required to have like good characters go to seminary, most of them. You just have to have good grades and like that kind of thing. You've gone to whatever seminary, maybe well-known seminary or something. And then usually what happens is, oh, you send sermons of uh, whether, I don't know, two, three sermons or something. And then many times you're invited to go over to that church. Uh, they get your plane ticket and you go over and then you preach a couple sermons. And they go, oh, you know what? They teach well. They're qualified. And many times, sure, not always. I mean, many times, thankfully, people are qualified, I think. But many times they're not. And you don't know how this person's really living their life, whether they're biblically qualified or not. And many times it does happen where after a few months, usually, uh, the problem starts coming up. Kind of like in marriage where you start sharing life more and like things come up. You, you notice things that you never knew before. And uh, many times there are serious problems in churches. Well, God's word is sufficient. It tells us this is a qualification. So this is my belief based on scripture, but it's this. That, of course, there has to be you know people that know this person well. They really do know this person well. And I know that's why usually you have, um, what do you call that thing, um, where somebody can recommend somebody? Reference? Usually there are things like that, but uh, even then, many times, um, well, it should be somebody that like knows a person very well. But uh, yeah, just the main point is that it's implied that uh, there's much more sharing of life that you you actually know the person well, uh, e even whether they're free from the love of money. Again, um, how would somebody know that about somebody? Somebody to think about. How do they spend their money? implied his closeness it's uh it's interesting that you should bring up the uh, pastoral search because we're actually going through that right now oh okay <laughs> yeah uh, I'll go our ahead. pastor retired yeah um you know from what i know uh i mean just from this we're going over i uh i know i think i can say most churches this part is pretty far away where there's this much of a sharing of life and closeness so that you really know the person well um, but yeah I mean I, I hope things are done well and it's a good pastor I mean yeah there are you know many times thankfully usually I think pastors truly are regenerated they're truly born again and so you have good character but uh, there are cases where I mean I know um, this, this is especially I think this is worse in Korean Christianity South Korean Christianity where they so emphasize, okay, as long as you went to seminary, especially a pretty well-known seminary, and if you have a, a doctorate, that's even a serious bonus, you got a THD, 
you have like really nothing. That's like the most important thing. And you're, you're good, good with sermons, giving sermons. And as long as um, that's pretty much the case, you're like, you know, 70% you pass. And when it comes to like, whether they're a lover of money or not. Okay, think about this. We probably know of lots of cases where pastors, they say that there are like uh, three things that pastors often fall into. You know what those are? I think you would know. Like disqualifications, um, disqualified, that kind of, you know, where they fall and stuff. With women issue, uh, women's not the problem. It's they're the problem. They, they're not careful with a women issue. I think we know that. Uh, wealth, money, and then uh, fame. But um, yeah, even though, uh, and I think, I think money and uh, f- uh, women, that's generally the most common uh, where disastrous things occur. Two churches I've been a part of, <clears throat> the pastors fell with just a woman other than his wife. And they, they became disqualified, which is right. They need to become disqualified. But, um, and that's why, I mean, think about it. Okay, what's the second qualification right here? In the Bible, after it says above reproach, the number two listed is what? The husband of one wife. Yes, husband of one wife. And most usually understand that as not that, you know, it's not going into polygamy stuff. It's, the language is a one woman man. And generally the way it's understood, and I take it this way too, is uh, during this time in this context, it, it was usually a given that they're married. Most uh, men and women, they got married pretty early on, like late teens and early teens, late teens. And so Paul's point is a one woman man is, I mean, just look at that language. They just have their wife, okay? Their wife is the only female they have. That's the second qualification listed. But um, in one of the churches where the pastor fell, I I noticed that, like, I almost never see the pastor and his wife together. What's this man's relationship with his wife, if he's married? Um, He's really, like, he only has his one wife and um, above reproach etc and then they need to be free from the love of money and i'm making the point about how do you know that what's implied is the closeness so you know the person well but um so that's first timothy 3 titus 1 and their parallels and then um you know i made the point last week about uh one church that i was kind of a part of where after the service they spent like we spent um it can be two hours i mean no some people they leave a little sooner but it can be one hour two hour three hours sometimes four hours they're spending time at that house they're so like family hanging out with each other fellowshipping sharing life you really know what's going on and it was a wonderful experience and um in that context there was in a separate youth group I mean, it was house church, but just uh, older people, they learn from, uh, excuse me, younger people learn from the older because they naturally see, I mean, the 16-year-olds, they see, you know, 18-year-old, 20-year-old, 22-year-old, 30-year-old, they talk with each other and they look at how they behave. And so they naturally learn. They're not, 16-year-olds are not just with 16, 15-year-olds. They're with 30 year olds or 35 year olds. They talk with each other. Uh, it was, it, that was just beautiful. And that's how it's supposed to be. I, I, I went over this, you know, before, but when you keep one, two year olds isolated as much as possible, three, four year olds isolated as much as possible, uh, you do it that way, five, six year olds isolated. What happens? The opposite happens. What do they learn? But that's literally what we have in, in modern day system. That's how it is. And so, um, you know, I, this was introduced to me by Paul Washer, but he goes into the generation gap and the whole setup is absolutely the worst. The setup is in such a way that if you want to 
keep people as immature as possible to mature as slowly as possible, that's the system you want. And that's exactly what we have uh, since decades ago, where that ha has become the set norm. But that's not supposed to be the case. Um, yeah, younger, learning from older people and like, you know, single people see marriages and they, they see, I know I shared last week about how I got to see one brother. I went over with a little bit of food and um, I got to see how he had, he did his uh, family service with his kids. He, he had, he has like uh, seven kids or so. And it, it was just a great experience getting to see how he leads. And not only that, every week when I go over, I see how the parents interact with the kids once in a while when a kid does wrong how they take their kid aside or they they you know chasing them or whatever i got to see all that and so um that's how it would have been uh, in the, whether the first century or uh, hopefully much of church history so you so learn like that but with that um there's also uh you know things that you notice and um the next uh section with closeness this is the same page three i think yeah same page three with closeness also higher possibility of fraction issue relation reconciliation church discipline thing but mainly the correction part under that okay those that are married they know this okay so i have a brother that got married uh many years ago and uh so this is very interesting because I used to think that when you first get married, that the first two years you have the best time of your life because that's just kind of what I got from younger days. And then only after like a couple of years, as you, you know, become used to each other, that you're, you're, you know, less happy and, you know, there are issues that come up. But um, what I, what I learned is, so I, I had this one, one brother that got married and uh, a few months later we met up. And uh, I asked him, so, you know, how's the marriage life, you know? And honestly, I was just expecting for him to be like absolutely just excited and smiling and being like, oh, it's like heaven. <laughs> um, that's what I was expecting. But this was very surprising to me. He kind of paused for like, I think, a, a, I don't know, maybe a few seconds. And he said, you know, like marriage is more difficult than I thought or something and I was very very surprised because I just didn't expect that and you know this this is a you know good brother that has good character and stuff and yet he told me that like marriage is is difficult that like there are struggles or issues basically and when I was uh serving as, as a young adults uh young adults pastor um one deacon uh he um we had a winter retreat one time and he volunteered to give a seminar on marriage because you know this is a young adults group like people in their 20s and things like that and uh, he, I was very impressed actually I really appreciate what he did because I, I, I honestly didn't expect uh, such a good seminar but I think he had given it before and he pointed out that uh, I know it would probably differ among people but he, what he said was uh, like the first two years of marriage are like the hardest times of marriage. And he was explaining that, okay, two people who of course have never lived with each other, who have totally different backgrounds. Well, not maybe not totally, but pretty different backgrounds. You have your own preferences. You have your own you know ways and what you spend your money on, what you prefer. So many things are different, but now you're living with each other, not just in the same house, you're not housemates. You're literally now one. And when you become married, like everything you do together, you have to make decisions together and all kinds of things. And uh, so many things come out. You know, if, if someone's been married, they they know this, but so many things come out where, uh, okay, you know, I prefer this, but then you prefer this. Okay, what are we going to do? And um, okay, I don't think that's a good way of spending money and, you know, this and that and all kinds of stuff. And so this would, it, this would have been why that, that brother, like, 
you know, told me what he told me, and I was very surprised. But the point is this: it's because you become so close that issues come up. Because again, when your when your relationship is where you see each other ten minutes, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes a week, and it's pretty shallow, like the modern day typical church life. There's nothing. You, you, you almost never have issues. Why would you have issues? You, you barely spend time with each other. So I, I know that um, with closeness, issues come up. And uh, so right here now um, with the first part where it goes into you know Acts six, those things, those are issues that are recorded in the Bible. Um, I guess we can start there. Uh, the Acts six. So, the Bible records issues that have come up, uh, and we, we know this issue where Acts 6.1, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So, uh, the churches uh, in, in Jerusalem, and um, mainly in Jerusalem, and there are you know, thousands and thousands, and... Um, there was a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. So Hellenists, remember this context where before the Roman Empire, there was a Greek Empire that was spread all over with the Hellenistic culture and language. I mean, the whole New Testament is written in Koine Greek, common Greek, because the Greek culture, everything is just spread all over the place. But then uh, Rome, uh, you know, took over the Roman Empire. But e even, even in, in this time period, Greek was the main thing, and um, Hellenists were those who were Hellenized, they were uh, Greek-influenced, uh, whether language issue, or more with uh, the, the culture and that kind of influence. You know, we, we did a whole study on the topic of influence. Influence is huge. And Hellenists were, they were Jews physically, but they were pretty uh, influenced by the Greek culture. And... Um, now, one opinion is it's more of the language issue. The other is it's not really a language issue. It's like more a culture issue. But um, whichever one it is, basically the Hellenists are more uh, uh, Hellenized, more Greek influenced versus the Hebrews. Those are more Orthodox, uh, you know, where we're Jews and we're going to remain separated. And if, you, if you're in Jerusalem, you're much more um, less Greek influenced. So here's what's so relevant. And we see the same kind of thing in Romans 14, but uh, it's, it's pretty likely, I mean, I, as a matter of fact, it's, I would say it's, it's quite likely that when it says the Hellenist widows were neglected in the daily dis distribution, that this was not accidental, but this was intentional. That's really possible. So, the Hebrew side, who are much more like, you know, more, more Hebrew, more Jewish, that they may have um, kind of looked down on the Hellenist Christians, who uh, they may have spoken um, Greek. They, they may have been more familiar with Greek. Uh, Aramaic is a, is a little more, you know, second language kind of thing. Also kind of behavior, maybe certain things. They were kind of what's the word, maybe slightly despised or kind of pushed away, something like that. So Hellenist widows were neglected in the daily dis distribution. So there's this issue that comes up. And so then, uh, verse 2, then the twelve apostles, they summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not good that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So, you know, okay, first of all, um, this is something I point out often. In verse 3, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, and we're going to appoint them over the business. Now, this is something that I, I bring up. Okay, so this implies that they knew each other pretty well, right? Because it says, choose from among you seven men of good reputation. 
how do you have seven men who are who have good reputation? They're known. If a church has a really shallow understanding of each other, they don't know each other well. Can you know anything of this among each other? Oh, this brother, this sister is full of the Holy Spirit. We don't know that. So that's one of the things I point out at times. Um, but the main thing is uh, there. there's issue, and so then they resolve it by uh, appointing seven men. And uh, verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and on and on, seven men. And when you look at the names, they're all Greek names. And so with the issue that was going on where the Greek influenced Hellenistic uh, Jews, Jewish widows were neglected in the distribution, the solution is uh, we're going to get Hellenistic, Hellenized Jewish men among them who are going to um, take care of this business where they make sure their widows are not neglected. So look at how many things we can learn. The church is taking care of the widows. Now, today, usually in, in, in a place like America, like America, yeah, there are times where there, there may be some widows or older people. Um, they would usually need different help, not, not wealth-wise, because many times with, the how, with how this country set up, with, what do you call that, um, um, 401? 401k. Yeah, 401k, that, that stuff, and you know, social security, whatever. It's set up in such a way that usually they don't need help financially, but it's more like physically they may need help. So that's something that's more, uh, you know, applicable to us. But uh, in this time period, the reason why we have this right here in 1 Timothy 5, where there's a whole, uh, almost half a chapter in 1 Timothy 5, where it goes into Timothy, take care of the widows. The church takes care of the widows. Why? Because all throughout the Old Testament times and the New Testament times, they were the most vulnerable, weak, and they needed most help. Because uh, women in general, but especially older women, especially, usually, you know, they're a little bit older, if they're a widow, they didn't have a source of income. Remember, Jesus teaches about the widow that gave like two pennies or whatever? Um, she has so little. Many, many times, I mean, James 1, I think 27, James says, the pure and undefiled religion before God, before God and the Father is this, to take care of widows and orphans and to keep oneself unspotted, undefiled from the world. I'm pretty sure that's James 1, 27. Why does it say taking care of widows and orphans? Because they were the most uh, vulnerable, weak, that need help. And so the church is a family and so just like you take care of your own parents, well, this is family. So they're taken care of by the church. So it's a beautiful picture. Um, and in this situation, their widows were being neglected, uh, I think uh, likely intentionally, which is sad, but the Bible does not hide those information. The Bible is full of truth and it records what really happened. Um, Luke is not like, you know, okay, this is a negative thing in the church, so I'm going to hide it. No, he reports what really happened. So there are issues that go on. I know that. We know that. Um, but still, it should not be the case where you think, you know what, if the church becomes closer, there are going to be more issues, and therefore we're going to keep the distance, and we're going to make sure like um, there is not much closeness. I'm pretty sure there have been pastors, there are pastors like that, who know that um, when the church gets closer, it's much more easy for issues to come up. Again, you know, if you, um, you know, within family or um, marriage, uh, often the case, usually the case where there are much more issues because of the closeness. But, you know, I would have to say, this is not an option that you can pick and choose. Because so many passages imply that there is closeness. And so it's not an option. Where, but I prefer um, more distance, and so we're going to do it that way. I believe that's wrong. That's sinful. Because of so many 
things that are so clear all throughout the New Testament about the church. But uh, we see here this issue uh, in Acts 6, and then the other well-known one, if you go to Acts 15, in Acts 15, towards the end, uh, Acts 15, 36, so Apostle Paul and Barnabas, they went on their first missionary trip, uh, starting in Acts 13, but they, they were done with it, and then some time passed, and now, in 1536, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Okay, so remember, when you look at the missionary trips, they're planting churches. Paul and Barnabas, they're preaching the gospel. They're getting the gospel everywhere. And people get converted. And they're, they appoint leaders. And churches are established. And now they want to uh, check on them. That's what it says. See how they're doing. Now 37, uh, now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So in Acts 13, Acts 13, 13, now when Paul and his party, this is the first missionary trip, Paul and his party set sail from Paphos. They came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, this is John Mark, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Okay, so we don't know why John Mark uh, left them. Now, this John Mark is, is most likely, I think this is normally believed to be the, the John Mark who recorded the Gospel of John. Excuse me, John, Gospel of Mark, what am I saying? But um, anyways, John Mark, we don't know why, but what we do know is it's not because he, he like got sick or like some, some problem like that, because if that was the case, Paul would not have a problem taking Mark. But it's clearly implied that whether it was due to like whether fear or a lack of faith or something like that, um, John Mark, he just he had to withdraw. He started out with Paul and Barnabas. But he withdrew and he went back to Jerusalem. And so in Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas are about to check up on the churches, Barnabas, he wants to take Mark with them, give him another chance. But Paul insisted that they should not take him. Now look, this is totally an under understandable situation, right? Where one side is saying, you know what, let's give him another chance. Yes, he failed us kind of in the middle last time, but let's give him another chance. But Paul, he's more like, no, look, he failed us last time. We can't take him this time. And uh, 39, then there occurred sharp disagreement that they parted from one another. So they could not agree with each other on this issue. And so what's the solution? Uh, Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended to the grace of God by the brethren. So, yeah, this is what happens. And uh, so they, they went their separate ways. So things like this can happen. Now, I think sometimes uh, some pastors go a little too far on this like that as if like they, they would have like seriously like fought against each other or something but I think that would be going too far it tells us that they had sharp disagreement about this issue but based on what's clear of Paul and Barnabas's maturity I don't think they would have had um, that kind of fighting or something um, and it's not because I have like this perfect view of the church or something I know there are issues but so this was around like anywhere from 48 AD to 51 AD when this happened. Now, you don't have to go there, but in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul brings up Barnabas. And um, I, I believe, it's, I believe so it's implied. I'll just read a passage. 1 Corinthians 9, 3. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have... Uh, the right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife? 
as do the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and uh, Cephas, or Peter. Verse 6, Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Okay, so Paul here brings up Barnabas when uh, he goes into the right to be financially supported by a church. That's the context. But he brings up Barnabas. And based on how he brings up Barnabas, I believe that already by this time, when Paul's writing 1 Corinthians, they had already worked again together. Um, because it's implied that the Corinthians know Barnabas, number one, right? Because if they don't know Barnabas, why would Paul bring up Barnabas like that? So the Corinthians know Barnabas. And so it seems quite likely that Paul and Barnabas had already ministered to the Corinthians, like maybe t together. 1 Corinthians was written like 54 AD. So it had been about five years since Acts 15, where, you know, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. And then, as most know, um, by the time you get to 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4, you know, the last letter of Paul, 2 Timothy 4, 9, where Paul is writing to Timothy, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. So most of the times when pastors go into the Acts 15 uh, incident, they'll go to 2 Timothy 4 right there. By the end of Paul's life, Mark had become useful and says, bring Mark also because he's useful for me in the ministry. So not only was there, you know, I don't even know if reconciliation is the right word because I don't believe that Paul had a personal animosity or whatever, like there's an issue between uh, Paul and Mark or something. But it's just when it comes to the second missionary journey, we shouldn't take him because he failed us. It was that issue. But what we do see is, I, I wouldn't say it's so much reconciliation issue. It's the fact that he is useful now. He, he became useful for the ministry. So there was that kind of growing. Uh, somebody that many years ago, Paul said, you know, we can't take him. He's not qualified. By then, it's he's useful for me. So there's that kind of growing that happened. And um, it's sort of a good relationship aspect too. But So that's why I have those passages. And then um, let's go to the correction part. So when you look at the correction part, Within the same like paragraph or whatever, uh, if you just go down a few lines, there's correction, sanctification, quote unquote sanctification, growth, maturing, happening. Okay, guys, um, one of the goals and one of the huge parts of the Christian life is growth, maturity, sanctification, uh, quote unquote improving, becoming more like Christ. And yes, um, the number one thing is dwelling in the word and the presence of God and prayer. But, guys, one another is just so huge. Uh, we can see some um, Proverbs, I guess. Well, since we're in, in Acts, we can just flip to Luke real quick. But Luke 17, verse 3, 4. If somebody wants to read 3, 4, and then we'll check some Proverbs. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Yeah, thank you. So take heed to yourselves. And then um, if your brother sins, rebuke him. That's what Jesus says. So it's an obligation. J Jesus commanded us. He taught us this okay it's not an option and you know uh, I, I one time heard from one pastor that his wife said that Americans are so thin-skinned that no one can say anything against each other and that's overall true generally and it's really sad because even if the pagan culture around or the outside culture is like that 
That shouldn't be the case with the church. Because all throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, all throughout the Bible, God sending prophets over and over, calling to repentance, many times even with harsh words, uh, all over the place, rebuke, correction, on and on. And Jesus says right here, if your brother sins, rebuke him, uh, bring it up. And then if he repents, then there's forgiveness. Both are extremely important, the rebuking and the repenting and forgiving. Um, I think usually the, the forgiveness part is really emphasized and taught a lot. We, we all know about, you know, if you don't forgive, uh, there's no forgiveness, which is scary, it's serious. But uh, rebuking, uh, very important. And then, um, I guess the Proverbs, uh, there's so many, but um, Proverbs 12, 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Yeah, so whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Let's see here. The word the word stupid here, um, the word normally describes dumb animals that lack intellectual sense. Here it describes the moral fool who is not willing to learn from correction. He is like a dumb animal. Yeah, um, good note. So, uh, it, it's taken really seriously, uh, the issue of correction. And then 1512. A scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. It's pretty self-explanatory. And then 3132. The ear that hears the rebuke of life uh, that can be life-giving rebuke. Man, look at that. Life-giving rebuke will abide among the wise. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul. Man, look at that. 32 again. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. And, um, you know, just... In, I know I didn't put the 33, but... The fear of Yahweh is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Humility is a really huge thing when it comes to correction. Um, you know, I believe that, you know, there, there's um, a lot of teaching and stuff on uh, pride and humility. I, I would say, according to the Bible, one of the biggest things connected to humility is willingness to receive correction, willingness to receive rebuke. Um, when people lack humility, when people uh, have pride, I believe one of the greatest manifestations of that is they won't listen. Um, they're not willing to even listen. So, I mean, I've, I've encountered this uh, a few times. Um, pretty recently, one time, uh, I was email with somebody that I don't know as well. I pointed out some things and totally rejected it and just they hated hearing it. And then in um, Proverbs 18, 18, 1, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and rages against all wise judgment. So pretty self-explanatory. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. Look at that. This isolation thing, brethren, isolation has no part to do with the church, okay? There's no such thing, or I should say, no part to do with the Christian. Isolation is never right, never ever. There's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. That's like oxymoron, it doesn't make any sense. Um, I know this is Old Testament, but yeah, a man who isolates himself they end up seeking their own desire. It's about their preference and what they want and their this and that with no one that's watching over. Accountability is huge. And he ends up, you know, raging against all wise judgment. Um, and then uh, 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So, okay, this is pretty relevant uh, in that 
Okay, faithful are the wounds of a friend. It describes correction as wounds. Basically, you get punched. Okay? You get hit. That's how it's described. Of course, this is not literal of where you get punched or, or something, but these are described as wounds because usually discipline, you know, there's like the discipline chastening, um, the, the, the belt or the rod, um, what do you call that thing where you spank or spanking a child, you know, that kind of thing. Faithful are the wounds of a friend versus the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You see the contrast of wounds, kisses, and then you see friends versus enemy. A good friend, a good brother will give you good, faithful wounds. Versus, when it comes to kisses of an enemy, that's flattery, mainly. Uh, there are people that can flatter you uh, to make you feel good. But... Usually, I mean, I, I know that there are times where honestly, they're, you know, they're, they're really honestly just sharing, you know, I really like this about you or they can, you know, kind of flatter whatever, but just there are also many times where people will flatter and say things positive so to make you feel good so that you like them. Um, that's their goal. In actuality, they care about themselves. They want to be liked. They want you to like them. And so in order to do that, they'll flatter with you. But the opposite of a friend, of a true brother or sister in Christ, they will give you good wounds. Um, you know, you should even welcome pretty big wounds, like a punch to the face, figuratively, because um, it's for your good. And so those are faithful and trustworthy. And then um, the 17, verse 17, well-known, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. It's just such a sharpening thing that goes on of each other. Uh, 20, 3, 23. He who rebukes a man will find more favor afterward than he who flatters with the tongue. We just saw something very similar, but one thing that's new here is he who rebukes a man will find more favor right away. No, afterward. Later on, people will many times come to realize, you know what? I initially didn't like that rebuke, but as they grow, as they mature in the future, they come to realize that was actually good. Um, that was beneficial for me. I'm glad that person told me this and it was beneficial for me. They come to realize it afterwards. So many times you can't expect thankfulness initially right away but later on weeks later months later years later they come to realize that was good advice that was good rebuke so yeah um, sometimes you can't expect it right away and um, the Proverbs 9 is just basically how some people scoffers they do not you know it, it's better to not tell them you know this is very unfortunate you can turn there if you want but I'll just read it in Proverbs 9, 7, 9, he who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. You know, um, there are... Look, there are situations where, based on my relationship with this person, I don't know this person well, we're not close enough, and I'm. it's likely that this person, my uh, bringing correction to this person is not going to result in good. Based on some things that I know about this person, they'll probably not take what I say. So even though I believe that this will be beneficial for them, I end up not bringing it up. Uh, there are other people where it's this kind of person right here. Basically, don't correct the scoffer. Do not correct the scoffer lest he hate you. In Matthew 15, there is a situation where Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. It's the first half of Matthew 15. 
Jesus rebuked them about, you know, when they go into the tradition versus the word of God. Remember, the Jews had the tradition of washing their hands and stuff, and Jesus didn't follow it, and his disciples didn't follow it. And so they bring up that issue, and Jesus says, you guys are hypocrites. You guys uh, have your tradition, but you don't keep the word of God. You don't even, you know, give, you don't even support your parents. And um, the Korban thing, um, you know, supposedly just giving it to God instead of helping your parents. He rebuked them, and the disciples recorded Jesus, do you know that they were like offended when you told them this? Do you know what Jesus says? It's a very scary response. Jesus says, let them alone. Um, it's, I'll just, I'll just read it. Uh, in Matthew 15, then his disciples came and said to him, this is Matthew 15, 12. Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But Jesus answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. When their disciples reported they were offended, Jesus doesn't go, Oh, really? I should go back and apologize. He doesn't do that. He actually says, You know, basically, they're not planted by my Father. My father has not planted them. They're not a part of God's people. And he says those scary words, let them alone. And uh, that they're blind guys of the blind. And that the blind needs the blind blow to fall into a ditch. Uh, in Revelation 3.19, Jesus said to the church, As many as I love, I rebuke and chastise. Therefore be zealous and repent. So Revelation 3.19 is the seven letters to the seven churches. To the last church, Jesus says, As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline or chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. You probably also know Hebrews 12. In Hebrews 12, one of the evidences that you are a child of God is that the Father rebukes you. He disciplines you. Remember that? Well, the same is the case for human parents and children. The same is the case for, for God and his children, and the same is the case for one another. Where we uh, know each other well, we share life, and we love each other that when we notice things that are concerning, you know, I remember, you know, I, I know there's somebody right here who, with issue of marriage, kind of recently, they brought it up, I'm concerned about this marriage. Um, that kind of a thing, where because you really care about them, you bring it up. And unfortunately, there are times where they don't listen, but you do, you do your part because you care about them. And so this comes with closeness. Uh, when you like, you know, if you meet somebody <clears throat> the first day or the second day, you usually don't bring up correction. It's once you kind of develop a good relationship, and once you kind of know each other better, that's when um, not only do you notice things, but you feel comfortable enough, and it's more natural that you bring up, hey, brother, hey, sister, um, I noticed this, that, uh, what you said, the way you spoke, or something you did, or, um, you know, you wanted to go in this kind of place. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, yeah. So, I guess uh, we'll be ending here today. Any any thoughts today? Any thoughts, questions, anything? Anything new? So we saw um, mainly about the closeness part and um, just the closeness being implied with uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and then we saw 1 Timothy about pastors also and just the closeness, getting to learn from each other, good examples and uh, yeah, learning from each other um, and then a lot of correction things. Yeah, in Revelation, we didn't see that, but uh, in Revelation, doctrinally also, that passage is where Jesus says, I have this against you, that there are some in the church that are eating things, sacrificed to idols, and committing sexual immorality. And Jesus says, the problem I have with you, your church, you guys, is that you guys have some in your church 
that have that kind of um, like belief, that kind of uh, practice. And so what the church was doing wrong is keeping those people in the church because that influence spreads. And that's another thing that just, I guess, in God's providence came up. You know, in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul goes into a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you read that chapter, 1 Corinthians 5, remember, it starts out with the man who uh, was sleeping with his father's wife. And they were supposed to, um, the church was supposed to kick him out. But he left him there. And um, he, he says that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And then he goes into, if a person says they're a Christian, but is sexually immoral, a reviler, greedy, etc., that you need to um, cut them off, basically, so that they come to repentance. Because negative influence, it spreads in the body. So that's another huge thing. And that's why um, it's supposed to be where correction is pretty common. And it's supposed to be where we're humble enough to listen. Now, I, I know there are okay, a lot of things involved, like how you bring correction. I know the whole thing of, you know, um, speaking in a loving way and out of love and things like that. Yeah. But there are cases... Like, if you look at the Galatians 2 passage, the Galatians 2.14 is when Paul rebuked Peter in front of everybody. And uh, remember, because he was compromising on the gospel. And he had to, because this was such a serious compromise that in front of everyone, it, it, it tells us plainly in Galatians 2, before everyone, he publicly rebuked Apostle Peter um, that you're compromising on the gospel because you're separating yourself with the other you know, Jews pro-circumcision people and you know the gospel you know that you know the gospel is open to gentiles there's no jew or greek in the gospel but you are still sticking with that old like separation with, from the gentiles thing siding with that side and he had to publicly rebuke him also uh, there's first timothy 5 actually uh, at the end of first timothy 5 when it comes to elders that um you publicly rebuke elders if it's clear that they're compromising. Now, I've never seen that done, but that's in the Bible. And when you look at 1 Corinthians 5, overall, usually Paul's not speaking in a, a lovey-dovey, gentle tone, if you know 1 Corinthians. Many times he speaks in a pretty firm, uh, even quote-unquote harsh way. And I'll just quickly read 1 Corinthians 6. I mean, look at this. 1 Corinthians 6, 1. Dare any of you guys, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you incompetent to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more are things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgment concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it not? Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. So, if you just read this, you can sense the tone that um, he's speaking firmly because of the disaster situation. But um, generally, uh, you know, especially like personally, when there's something, most of the times it's a gentle, you know, tone, that kind of thing, and quote unquote out of love. I mean, Paul is out of love too, but yeah. So, yeah, for for the benefit of one another so um, no thoughts or anything all right well um, so yeah Lord thank you for this uh, blessed time together uh, where we get to go into your word and just uh, very various things Lord about closeness of the church what's implied in your word Lord God um, how Things can be so far away, Lord, uh, from what your word lays out clearly, uh, the closeness of the church, how it's so family-like. It's really a family, literally. 
who belong to each other, Romans 12, that we really belong to each other. Just like a natural family, a physical family. Um, the things that we share, the closeness involved in each other's lives and how the world is supposed to see the church who's so like, who's so family, the amazing love they have for one another, the care, and uh, are amazed and they recognize that this group of people, they're very special. Lord, I pray that all over the world um, there would be this very thing that unbelievers, Muslims, uh, atheists, Hindus, they see how these people, they will die for each other if they need to. And they recognize there's something about this group uh, that they would know, that they would come to know. This can't be possible naturally. There's something here. And they would come to be interested in the faith and come to come to faith and the Lord Jesus. So thank you for this blessed time. May you have been pleased. And Lord, Lord, I pray, Lord, really, that this very thing we're going over, that this would be a reality, Lord, in your church. I know this is your will. So I pray according to your will, for your will. In Jesus' name, amen.